At ease, soldiers. All right, which one of you idiots broke the sun? It's really freaking hot in Vancouver right now. We're in the middle of a heat wave, and so I need to have my fans on in the background. Otherwise, I'm just going to cook from the inside out like an egg that got cracked on the sidewalk. A bit of a macabre simile, but honestly, it does kind of go with the theme of the books that we're going to be talking about today. This is my microphone, everybody. Usually I have it balanced on my camera, uh, but today we're going to hold it. Otherwise, you can hear all the foom, foom, foom of my fans, which are 100% necessary. There's literally no longer ice in this, and I've been recording for a minute and 14 seconds. Oh god. For some ungodly reason, I decided that today was the day that I wanted to film my July wrap-up, because I did not get around to reading the things that I thought I was going to, and yet I still had a fantastic time with a whole lot of pages. The books I read this month just truly confirmed that god, I love a good nickname. There was also a surprising amount of emotional maturity in the books that I read this month, which good communication and relationships in this economy? So without further ado, grab a drink, grab a snack, and buckle in while we discuss the collection of choices I made while reading this July. First up is one that I mentioned in my mid-year book freak out tag as being the one with an exclusive review. So now you guys get the full picture because I finished Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White and I had an amazing time with the grossest book that I have ever read. Now if you're chronically on TikTok like I am, this was recommended to me for months before it came out. I literally wrote down how many people influenced me to buy this. It was influenced by Books, Dogs, and Coffee, Chloe the Elven Warrior, Hobbit's Library, Choose Love Books, Arms Reading, and so many more. This is a grotesque horror dystopian novel that talks about bonds of loyalty at the end of the world in a literal fuck ton of religious trauma. Like, I didn't even know you could put so much body horror into one book, but here we are. We follow our main character, a trans boy named Benji, who is escaping from his religious cult. However, he's already been infected with a bioweapon that is slowly turning him into a macabre monster monster that is supposed to help cleanse the world. During his escape, he gets taken in by a group of queer teenagers who are part of a rebellion against this cult, and Benji starts to learn the meaning of friendship and family while he's starting to mutate into a creature of biblical proportions. This book is disgusting. Disgusting. It is a black, sinewy, liquefying masterpiece that gives you all its teeth and bites. To all my trans followers out there, <laughs> you're only transitioning into the opposite gender and not the personification of the will of God. That's an incomprehensible being of flesh and eyes that's supposed to bring about the wrath of heaven on earth. <laughs> God, you're so basic. Now, this is not a book for people who have deep religious trauma, a plague phobia, or dislike body horror. But I'm somebody that's an atheist, triple vaxxed, and doesn't mind reading about people of throwing up their liquefied internal organs, so I thought it was great. <laughs> All right, next up on this list, we're gonna get a little less gross, and we're gonna talk about an amazing sequel that I read this month, and that was The Genesis Wars by Akemi Don Bowman. I was sent this by the author herself, so thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this. If you've been following my channel for a little while, you know that last year, The Infinity Courts was one of my favorite books of 2021, with a plot line that basically says, what if Siri took over Heaven, a fantasy sci-fi mashup with an AI afterlife about human souls rebelling against AI overlords that have taken over and are slowly trying to erase human consciousness in dreams, with a cliffhanger ending that made me want to throw the novel. It freaking slapped. This one did take a little bit to get into. Like, I felt nothing really happened for the first little while, except our main character feeling guilty, and as somebody who gets secondhand embarrassment very easily, it was a bit of a rough start. But once stuff starts happening, it's like, holy shit, like, get Get in the car, stuff's happening, keep up. There's so much in here about morality and mortality and death. And also where is the line between feeling and thinking that you're feeling something. And I unabashedly love Caitlin with this self and any future selves I may regenerate as. As a book that picked up after one of the most heart-stopping cliffhangers that I've read in a very long time, the cliffhanger ending of this <laughs> made me scream. How dare you do this to me? Oh my God, I finished this at work in a side office and I was trying so hard not to alert all of my coworkers that I was in fact not doing work. Look, it was a slow day. I was reading at my desk. My supervisor doesn't care, but she might care if I yelled as loudly as I wanted to when finishing this damn thing. Like good goddamn Akemi Don Bowman, you know how to write an ending. Whew, that's for sure, my lord. Also, if you follow me anywhere else, you would have known that July to me was sequel month. I was 
like, all right, you know what? It's time to put up or shut up and freaking read all these things so you can put them, you know, with your bookshelves again. So another sequel that I picked up this month was God Slayers by Zoe Hanimikuta, which is the sequel to Gear Breakers, which once again, if you have been watching me for a little while, you know that Gear Breakers was another one of my favorite books of 2021. Sapphic, more dystopian Pacific Rim. Do I need to say any more? The Kingdom of Gondolia has started creating these giant metal mech bots as their military and pilots like Sona are known as windups and then rebels like Eris are known as gear breakers who intend to basically jump these uh, mech bots and then take them down from the inside out. But of course, when our two main characters find each other, um, oh my god, the government's been lying to us. Wow, we need to take down something from the inside out and uh, rebels and like family. And first of all, good god, I forgot how much I love the words of this world. It just satisfies something in my brain when I say the words wind up, zenith. Mech Vesper, Star Breach, and this sequel was truly to die for. We are back and we are angry. But also the major vibe of this book for multiple characters was, I look pretty good for a dead bitch. She's alive! And something I really appreciated that I don't usually see in YA is that there was a huge exploration of PTSD in war. Like, oh, you just thought you were going to gallivant around basically committing war crimes and killing a bunch of people with no mental consequences whatsoever? What are you, a god? Oh, wait. There was a couple of odd time skips in this one, but there was such fantastic camaraderie that I truly didn't care. Not only does this explore war and hurt and family, it also explores guilt so, so well. There were a lot of emotions. I was sobbing by reading the end of this. Oh my god. It was like Hunger Games Mockingjay Jay 2.0. This is a absolutely phenomenal duology, and I will 100% be invested in anything this author ever writes in the future. Should I just get all the sequels out of the way? Let's do it. Another fantastic sequel I had a ton of fun reading this month was The Inadequate Heir by Danielle L. Jensen. This is a sequel slash companion novel to her Bridge Kingdom series. That also were some of the best books I read last year. This is a new adult fantasy series about a kingdom that is within a bridge that lays between two countries with fierce storm seasons and much political unrest. In the first book we follow a princess from Meridrina who is marrying the king of the Bridge Kingdom in a forced political alliance. This book follows a couple of side characters from that series, mainly Prince Karis and General Zara. Just know that like this is happening while Laura and Aaron are having their couple shenanigans where the two sworn enemies meet each other under the cover of darkness not knowing the other one's identity, slowly fall in love and slowly share ideas of having a unified kingdom. But when identities are revealed in <laughs> truly a <laughs> <laughs> a manner like I've never read before. Gotta go down as one of the worst hookups in history. Their connection is tested and politics within both kingdoms explode as the two of them try to reconcile with their own thoughts and yet also reconcile their kingdoms. I know the Bridge Kingdom and her other series, The Stolen Songbird Trilogy, does get some renown online, but like she is truly so slept on. The tension in this is so Good. The banter is so funny. The chemistry is on point. Zara is too much of a badass for me to comprehend. Like every time she comes on page, my brain just takes a screenshot. And I love that Karis keeps a book on him at all times. Like I love a man who can read. And you know what else I love? A good rousing speech. <clears throat> if you're interested at all in continuing the story of Laura and Aaron, I would highly recommend reading this because it also uh, plants some seeds for more down the timeline. So like if you want to read a happy ending, read the Bridge Kingdom duology, and if you want to continue on with the story, uh, pick up The Inadequate Air. Next up is a book that I unfortunately did not like this month, which is quite surprising because I have been head over heels starry eyed about getting a copy of The Romance Recipe uh, by Ruby Barrett, and unfortunately I ended up dealing effing this one. I am going to talk about it because I read the majority of it. If I read over 50%, I will rate it and talk about it online. This was supposed to be a cute sapphic restaurant rom-com between a head chef who used to be on reality TV and the owner of a restaurant that is slowly going downhill and the two of them getting together to like revamp the, the restaurant and then falling in love along the way. I absolutely loved Love and Other Disasters by Anita Kelly, which is another kind of cooking show sapphic rom-com. So I was so excited. This was going to be an amazing follow-up and and unfortunately, it just felt really flat. The pacing of this is what really threw me. Even at the very beginning, I felt like the author started the story in a strange spot because a lot of the buildup of tension that could have occurred from the two main characters meeting on page 
didn't occur and it was kind of like oh yeah by the way all this stuff happened in the past and we're here now also yes hello is this info dump city Yes, hi, I need you to come collect your mare. She's acting up again. And I don't want to rag on fan fiction writers or people who are on Wattpad or, or beginner writers. Because, you know, it takes a while for everyone to get their voice. And even though we like to make fun of Kindle Unlimited books or authors on Wattpad of not having good writing, you know, everyone is at a different journey in their life and everyone's looking to read a certain type of voice. But the writing and dialogue of this felt very juvenile considering the two main characters are in their 30s. But what I did really enjoy about this was the communication. Like, wow, talking about your feelings clears up misunderstandings and allows you to have an open and healthy dialogue with your partner. Who could have ever guessed that? And I need all of us right now to agree that we need to stop making fun of vegan cheese, okay? I am lactose intolerant. Cashew cheese is all I can eat. And I don't appreciate you taking that tone, talking about the one thing that gives me joy. I've seen a lot of people online really like this, uh, but unfortunately I'm not one of them. All right, up next is a adorable swashbuckling fantasy novel that I got sent by Candlewick Press, and that was The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea by Maggie Taduka Hall. Our main character is a genderqueer, gender fluid pirate named Florian, who is on board a ship called the Dove that moonlights as a luxury charter for travelers, when really it's a pirate ship of nefarious means that takes its passengers out to the middle of the sea and then robs them. And one of these passengers is the Lady Evelyn, who is being sent as part of an arranged marriage to a man she's never met. During the grace sailing period, Florian and Evelyn meet and fall in love. And you can bet there's probably some tension learning that the person that you have a major crush on is going to rob you and maybe throw your body in the ocean. What really surprised me about this is I thought this was going to be a fairly cute, piratey love story. Um, but then all that stuff happens pretty fast. And then you're like, oh, oh, there's so much more of this book and there's so much more of this plot. What's happening? You think this is going to be a cute queer love story on a boat, but then we also get witch training and political intrigue and a small heist. The sea is a full other character. She can feel where her ships are at all times and only favors the pirate Supreme's ship. Mermaids are a full character in this and they act as a memory keepers for the sea, which is why it's so dangerous to kidnap one. This is Pirates of the Caribbean meets Our Flag Means Death. It's got pirates, it's got queers, it's got mermaids, it's got queer pirate mermaids. Despite a bit of a heavy synopsis, this book is quite light, it's quite cute. It was a little wobbly in the middle and the ending was slightly underwhelming, but at the same time, Yo, know, we can't always have these gritty, dark, intense kind of piratey novels. I like that this one's a little bit more whimsical and the love story in it was really, really wonderful. So if you want a new swashbuckling book, I would highly recommend picking this up. And lastly, I can happily say that I read a book that I really, really enjoyed. And I don't know why it's taken me so long to read this damn thing when the entire internet has been like up my ass about reading it. When I graduated a couple months ago, my friend Emma gave me a copy of Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. If for some reason you don't know, the Brown sisters truly by Talia Hibbert is the darling of the romance novel series and uh, my friend got me the middle one because she said this one was her favorite and you can read all of them individually. This centers around Danny who is in the middle of getting her PhD and has no time for romance. However, she does have a cute security guard co-worker that she sees fairly often and through some miscommunication during a routine fire drill, the two of them end up going viral because he used to be a fairly large ex-rugby player and because Zaf is trying to get his sports charity off the ground, he and Danny embark in a fake dating situation to help both of them while they still have internet fame. Even though Danny puts some pretty strict rules on it, Zaf is a hopeless romantic and the two of them slowly start to fall in love. This book is so fucking funny. One chapter in and I am cackling. Danny has some amazing quips that I'm absolutely stealing. Do you have a personality or are you like me where you're just a bunch of book quotes in a trench coat? The academic in me does relate to Danny a little bit more, but something that Zaf and I can agree on is that there's always time for anxiety. And yes, we love a man who goes to therapy and is in touch with his emotions and likes sex books, yes. I also love the ending half of this book, specifically for the nuance that it gives to new relationships because the majority of romance novels, the entire plot is the two main characters getting together. And then once they're together, it's happy ending, everything's fine. But in this book, we get to explore a little bit of what it means once you've agreed to be in a relationship. And though I've never broken a table in that particular way, maybe that's something to add to my bucket list. <laughs> Am I gonna keep that in the video? Maybe, I don't know, I'm 27. I can do whatever the hell I want, I'm an adult. So thank you, Eva. I likely will be picking up the other two in the series. Oh my God, we freaking did it, y'all. It's currently 36 degrees Celsius, which is like, I don't know, a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. I'm in my pajamas, like this isn't even real clothing and I am, 
melting. I feel disgusting. Also, fun fact, as of a couple of days ago, I have been in my apartment for one year, which is wild to think about. Um, and literally the only reason that, that I made that connection in my brain is because I moved in during the last heat wave. So here we've come full circle. Please leave down below if you yourself have also read these or enjoyed these or what you read this July. I have my eye on a couple of things coming out in August, but truly the only thing that matters is that the end of August, Babel by RF Kwong comes out and I am so <laughs> excited. Also, yes, I know you can pronounce it Babel, but that's stupid. It's pronounced Babel and I will not be taking questions. Okay, that's enough of an outro. I need to go open my freezer and stand in front of it for a little while. You know where to click to like the video. You know where to click to subscribe. I hope you guys are having a nice day wherever you are and I will see you all next week. Bye.